We're going to continue where we left off last Wednesday um, with some discussion of sound and video um, with a more detailed discussion of um, some sound, basic sound phenomena and uh, an introduction to the sound editing software that we're going to be using um, in the first of the technical exercises this week. But I'm not in that software yet. I'm going to start um, using the software Max, which we don't really cover in this course, but I'm going to use it now because it's a good place to demonstrate some basics um, about sound. And right now in front of me, here in the middle of the left-hand side of the screen, you see a scope or you see a line, a curvy line, moving up and down. And that's um, a special thing called an oscillator, um, which is a really, really basic unit uh, of sound. It's a sine wave um, for the mathematically inclined. And right now this oscillator, this sine wave, is going up and down around the middle uh, one times per second because of this one over here. And that's very slow. It's slow enough that we can see it as something that goes up and down, um, uh, but not um, fast enough yet that we can start to hear it as sound. So I'm going to turn up the volume here. We still don't hear it. And now what I'm going to start to do is start entering some higher frequencies. So when I go to five times per second, we can see that it's vibrating back and forth faster, but we still don't hear anything. When I go to 10, still nothing. And when I go to 20, I'm going to start hearing something because I'm here uh, in my studio sitting in front of a really, really good pair of loudspeakers. So I'll probably start to hear something. But depending on where you are, you may not yet hear this sound. It's very quiet. When I go to 40, I don't know if you can hear that or yet not, but there's a deep bass presence in the room. I've got a, a waveform that's going back and forth around the middle 40 times per second, and that's producing a deep bass tone. There's 80 times per second. When I go to 160 times per second, uh, hopefully that is, is clearly audible to you wherever you are listening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double the, the frequency one more time. So now we're at 320 times per second, and we've got um, a kind of clear musical pitch, like something from the middle of the piano um, or the middle of some other instrument. Now, before going any further, I'm going to reduce the volume a little bit, because you may have noticed that as we've been increasing the frequency here, it's also been getting uh, subjectively louder to us. I'm going to keep increasing the frequency, a higher pitch, a very high pitch, a very, very high pitch, an extremely high pitch, and when I go to 10,000 hertz, I can still hear it as a kind of um, whistling high frequency presence, and as I go up from here, say 12,000 times per second, 14,000 times per second, it gets harder and harder to hear, depending on what condition your hearing is in and, and where you're listening and things like that. Um, and after about 20,000 hertz, no matter who we are, no matter how good our hearing is and where we are, we probably wouldn't hear anything anymore. So we've learned um, or observed some basic things there that we can now review. Um, we've been manipulating the frequency of a very simple sound wave. In other words, how many times per second it goes around the middle, or the rest position, if you want to call it that. And we noticed that as we increased frequency, that between about 20 hertz, or times per second, and roughly 5,000 hertz, we got the, a clear sensation of a musical pitch. And, and, and we learned, moreover, that as we increase the frequency, generally speaking, our perception of pitch went up. So we can talk about high pitches versus low pitches. We can also talk about higher, high frequencies versus lower frequencies. 
And we're talking here then about frequency and pitch, which is correlated to it. We're talking about one of the basic axes of sound as a phenomena. One of the things about sound that we are very sensitive to um, as human beings. And uh, in a second then, we're going to go on and we're going to talk about um, the other thing that we are very, very sensitive to in sound phenomena, which is quietness and loudness and where that comes from. So frequency and pitch, which we just talked about, are a phenomena that we can think of as being um, from the left to the right in this scope that we're seeing here in the middle of the screen. It's something that's stretched out in time. It's about how things happen in time. Our perception of loudness and with it quietness is closely related to the vertical dimension here. So I'm going to make it another scope so that we see this waveform that we're listening to in two different ways. So one scope is the sound um, as it comes out of my oscillator and another sound, another scope, is the sound after it comes out of this thing that lets me increase or decrease the volume. So we can see already just looking at this very high frequency wave, this 20,000 hertz wave, that when it comes out of the fader at the bottom that it's a lot smaller. Um, so right now this thing is making it smaller. Let's change the frequency just right down to a, a kind of middle frequency, 220 times per second or 220 hertz. And right now what we're listening to is the wave going to my computer's output system at this size. And as I pull down the fader, the vertical size of that waveform, how far away from the middle it goes, is decreasing. And with it, the sound is getting quieter until eventually I can't hear it anymore. And conversely, if I bring up this fader, uh, is that um, the vertical axis, um, which we usually call amplitude, or sometimes a little bit more informally, we might call it level. In other words, how far away from the middle does the signal go? And amplitude, or level, is really closely correlated to our perception of loudness. So that if we take a certain shape of wave and all we do is scale it down so that it's half as big, things will be quieter. And if we take the same shape of wave and we scale it so that it's twice as large, um, that, that, that the extremes of it, are the, the peaks and valleys, are twice as far away from the middle as they were before, we will be making a louder sound. Um, so managing these two axes, frequency and amplitude, is a kind of basic thing that people are paying attention to um, when they are working with sound. All right, so the next step is to talk about um, a very peculiar and unique characteristic of sound compared with our other senses, it's relative transparency. And so I'm going to change things up a little bit here and I'm going to add another sound to the mix here. I'm going to do it right in front of you. So let's um, turn up the volume on that 220 hertz sine wave. Hopefully you can hear that at home or wherever you're listening. And now I'm going to add to it another sound. Let's say um, a 550 hertz sine wave. So I haven't, I haven't connected it yet, so you don't hear it. Um, but suffice it to say that we have one sound here and another sound here, and we're just going to add them together and by connecting them to the same place. And so now you should have the dis distinct sensation of two different pitches. But if you look at what I'm sending to you, it's just one thing. They're being mixed together. And this down here, this is what we're listening to. So even though we're listening to one waveform, even though there's one sample level at a time coming out of my speakers here, 
coming out of your headphones, we get the distinct sensation of there being two sounds. So we might talk about this as being the relative transparency of sounds, which is that when we add or mix one sound with another under many circumstances, we hear them both. Now if you think about it, that's quite different from the way light and color and our sense of vision works. Um, it's relatively rare that we see two things in the same place or in exactly the same circumstance. Um, if we were going to see two things, usually we have to um, move the focus of our vision. We have to look in a slightly different direction or something like that. At any given point that we might focus on visually, we tend to see one thing. But with sound, um, we can sort of add, add, you know, continually add and mix new sounds in, and under many circumstances, we'll continue to hear the other sounds as they're layered in. One of the immediate consequences of this is that when people work with sound, there is a tendency to exploit this and to do a lot of a lot of layering, uh, a lot of complex layering of sound material, because after all, we're really good at perceiving that. Um, So because sound is basically transparent, or transparent under many circumstances, and because mixing sounds together, therefore, taking advantage of that transparency is a really, really common way of working with sound, um, there's a common problem, a basic problem that arises from that, that we can learn to avoid. Um, and it's the problem of clipping. I'll write the word for you here in the notes. And technically, what clipping refers to is when a signal goes above or beyond some limit. So if you think about the way that sound is reproduced, it's often produced with loudspeakers. A loudspeaker is a moving cone in a box or a pair of headphones. And that cone can only go so far, or else the loudspeaker would just break apart. If you try to make it go beyond that point, um, it, it won't happen, and you won't hear what the signal actually is. And as it turns out, that same thing, a kind of limit on how high or low the signal can go, um, exists at many stages of working with digital audio. Now, the way that this is connected to mixing and transparency is that as we add more and more sounds in, um, one of the ways that clipping happens is that adding more and more sounds in, eventually you reach a point where you're going to go over the maximum because of how much sound you've added. Um, we can demonstrate clipping and its effects just um, with one sound, though, um, and increasing its um, level or amplitude until it goes to the maximum. So we've got our 220 hertz uh, sine wave, our basic sound that we were working with We've been working with since the beginning and I'm going to fade it in and we start to hear it. It's a very pure tone and as the amplitude increases it gets louder and louder and louder and what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase it too much so that um, the tops and bottoms of the waveform here go up to the top, go up to the maximum of what we're allowed to have in this digital audio system. And I want you to listen to what happens to the sound. It doesn't only get louder. So as we went past the limit, um, it was almost like other sounds were being added in that sounded related to our original sound, a kind of distortion of the sound. That's one way of describing what we hear perceptually when sounds go beyond the limit, when they clip. Distortion. You know, so if we were to recap what we've learned so far, it would be that um, in terms of some basic things that happen with sound, that we can describe waveforms by how quickly they go around the middle line, that's frequency, and that's closely related to our musical sense of pitch, of things being low or high. Um, we also saw that we can characterize sounds by how widely they um, vibrate around the middle line. 
amplitude or level, which is closely related to our sensation of loudness or quietness. And then because sounds are transparent, it's really, really common to um, mix them together as a basic element of sound work. And this, but this is one or clip um, comes up. And clipping um, is, produces for us perceptually a sensation of distortion, or we might think of it as a buzz as well. So for a moment, I'm going to switch over to um, talking about the entire cycle um, of producing an edited audio project using the Audacity, the open source Audacity um, audio working with. So I've gone ahead and I've launched the Audacity audio editor. And already up here in the middle, top middle of the screen, we see a dancing level meter that uh, you might notice is closely correlated to my voice. Um, so one of the first things we're going to talk about is using Audacity as a recording interface. Um, I happen to be connected to some pretty high-grade audio hardware right now and a very fancy microphone, um, but you can make half-decent recordings um, with the built-in microphones on your computers as well. Uh, especially if, and we're going to talk a little bit about why this is in a second, especially if your sound sources are uh, in a controlled relationship and are relatively close to the microphone. Now, so um, I can start recording just by pressing the record button here. And you can see now the dancing levels in time um, of my voice as I speak to you. Now, a moment ago, we were talking about clipping. In other words, about sounds going beyond the um, maximum points of measurement. Um, and we talked about that as being a response to mixing in too many sounds, but it can happen uh, also just in recording. So this isn't going to sound very good, um, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to sort of whistle in front of the microphone, and I'm going to do it closer and closer to the microphone. And as I get closer and closer to the microphone, of course, the levels are going to get higher, and at some point they're going to be too high, and they're going to start to clip, and we'll hear that. So here, here I go. So those first few recordings, those first uh, couple of whistles are probably useful because they were, um, you know, there was a lot of level there, um, but not so much level that it was going beyond the limits. And then when it went beyond the limits, because I was quite close to the microphone, uh, I imagine that it might have sounded pretty terrible. It might have sounded like some kind of um, clipping-related distortion um, to you. So the software, coming back to where we started in this segment on Audacity, while we're recording, we see the waveform here, but we also see it uh, up here on the top of the screen in this meter that has zero on the far right and then a series of negative numbers as we go down and to the left. So that's a common way of measuring the level or amplitude of audio. It's a unit called decibels and um, negative 6 is half as much energy as 0, and negative 12 is half as much energy as negative 6, and so on and so forth. We don't need to worry about the details of that uh, too much right now. Um, the point, really, is that the software um, has this interface element here, this meter that shows you when you're in danger of clipping. And you'll find that almost all of the audio recording devices that you're likely to use um, maybe a voice recorder built into a phone or a special portable recorder um, or audio recording stuff built into video cameras. There's lots of different things we have that record audio these days. Um, probably has one of these meters here, and they're really useful because they can tell you when you're in, in danger of clipping or not. So if clipping is one danger during recording, the other one is of the, the danger of the levels being too low. Um, if the levels are too low, like way back here, well, you can probably still hear me pretty okay. If the levels are too low, what tends to predominate in the recording are various noise type signals, uh, hiss in the electronics um, in particular. Uh, and so for that reason, 
um, recording audio well, uh, a, a big part of it is making sure that the levels that you're picking up are reasonably high, but not so high that they're in danger of going over the top and clipping. And so usually when people are recording audio, they'll do a kind of test recording um, or test first, just to kind of get the levels right, and then we'll, and 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 establish what we might what we tend to call headroom, um, you know, um, a little bit of space between the levels that we're receiving and the top. Right now, if we look at our level meter up here, our headroom is you know it's about ten decibels because basically the top two bars on the graph are usually empty of sound level here. So we've got a little bit of headroom here. We've got a little bit of space into which our signal can go if it gets a little bit louder without danger of clipping. So that's recording um, in Audacity. I'm going to stop the recorder now. And we'll keep working with this project. Um, and the next step is to talk about importing sounds from other places into Audacity. All right, so one way of getting sound into our Audacity projects, as we've seen, is just recording them directly. Um, but perhaps for your projects, um, if you choose to do an audio-based project, um, a more likely scenario is that you're going to be recording on some other device and then um, taking that file and importing it into Audacity, into your Audacity project. So let's do something like that now. Um, in fact, I think I might delete this track um, that has my voice recording on it. So if I go to the file menu, um, in the middle of the file menu there's this option import. Um, and there are various things we can import, and the most important one is audio. So I'm going to pick that, and a file dialog comes up, and it's taking me right to my audio examples folder. And I've got a bunch of different audio files in here, mostly in the WAV format. Um, let's pick this one that says Italian Waves. Sometimes this warning comes up about whether it should make a copy of the files before editing or whether it should read the files directly from the original. And you can choose um, either one. It's fine. So this file, um, this Italian Waves file, we can see already it's different than the voice recording that we made a second ago. The voice recording had a single channel, but this file has two channels, left and right. Um, so I have a lot of these recordings that I've made over the years. I really like recording water, uh, and they're made with various portable recorders or various uh, sets of microphones, a stereo recording. So there's always a left channel and a right channel, um, corresponding in a loose way to the fact that we have two ears and can hear things um, spatially. Uh, over here, before I play this sound, which might be kind of loud, I want to point out that over here on the left of each track, there's a, a volume control, and it's at, by default it's at 0 dB in the middle, which means things play back as they are. And if we want to increase the level, we can move it to the right. If we want to decrease the level of this track, we can move it to the left. So I'm going to decrease it a lot so that it's not so loud. And I can pick a moment where I want to start playing from and then bring the volume up as I feel like it's safe. Well, you get the idea. Um, so we're going to work with this sound for a while. Um, but before we do, uh, I want to save our work so far and talk a little bit about um, a nuance of that that we've seen in our other projects so far, the difference between project files and deliverable files, or working formats and delivery formats. So I go to the File menu. There's a Save Project option. When I go save project, there's even a very helpful warning that comes up, so we should pay attention to this. 
It says save project is for an Audacity project, not an audio file. For an audio file that will open in other apps, use export. Don't show this warning again. Uh, I'm going to leave it on, even though I really, really don't need the warning. Um, but obviously lots of people are using Audacity as they start to work with audio, and so maybe do need this warning at first. All right, so sure, I'm going to save it into my audio examples folder, and I'll call it uh, 1AO3 um, audio demo. Save. And now let's go to that folder, audio examples folder, and look for that file. Should be here somewhere. Here it is, 1AO3 audio demo. Now I want you to look closely at the file over, the size of the file over here on the right. It's only six kilobytes. Now that's very, very small. Now let's look at the Italian Waves sound file that we imported. It's over here. It's 25.6 megabytes. Um, in other words, um, thousands of times larger than the um, project file that we saved. Now this points to something pretty important. Our project file doesn't contain any or necessarily much, doesn't necessarily contain any or very much of the actual audio data of our audio project. What it does contain is instructions for what audio files to access in order to produce the project. And this is a structure that's very common with audio projects, and it's also very common with video projects, that your project file contains instructions for accessing other files, but it doesn't actually contain the audio or video data. So there are two things, two very practical things that come from this. Thing number one is that as someone working with this stuff, you have to be careful to keep your project file and all the source files that it depends on, you have to keep them together. So a really good structure is to make a folder just like we did with our earlier project, make a, a, a new folder for the project and put everything related to the project in that folder. So the second thing that follows from this difference between um, project files and deliverable files is that when we are ready to share our beautiful audio projects with other people, we're not going to share our project files with them. Instead, we're going to render or export a new single sound file um, where all of the necessary sound data is there in the file um, and people can listen to it with a wide range um, of different pieces of software. So we'll get to that part um, at the end of uh, the, today's um, video lecture. All right, so I'm going to back up uh, to the beginning here. I'm going to press the rewind key. And in a second, I'm going to press play and carefully reduce the level because this sound can get a little bit loud. And um, something happens at the beginning of this recording that is quite common. Uh, and I think it's something that you're going to encounter uh, quite a bit in your own um, experiments with audio work as well. Let's listen to what happens at the very beginning of this recording. So um, if you were listening closely, in that first uh, few seconds of the recording there, there's a lot of handling noise as the recording starts. Um, this was probably made with a portable recorder. So when I was making it, I was probably pushing the record button and kind of putting the microphone down somewhere. And then after that initial moment um, that we're maybe not very interested in, then there's a long usable section of really nice clear recording of the waves. And then at the end, if we um, jump to there, once again at the end, there's um, some handling noise, um, presumably as I come and stop the recorder again. So this is really, really common that we make recordings and they're considerably longer than we need them to be. And that they, especially at the beginning and the end, um, perhaps other places as well, they have things in them that we're not interested in keeping. 
So a really basic audio editing task is to trim, um, trim the um, uh, recording. So one, there are different ways to go about this. Um, one way in Audacity is to decide where you want to start and to back up a little bit from that. And um, for now, just take it on faith that we have to back up a little bit from that. I'm going to explain more why in a second. Let's say that we, we estimate that we're interested in the sound about here. So I'm going to click and drag from there back. And now I can use the same kind of controls you would use in a word processor, cut, copy, paste, that kind of thing, delete, to get rid of that audio. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in my case, I'm going to press, because um, I'm using a Mac here today, I'm going to press Command X for cut. Be Control X on a PC. And lo and behold, that audio is gone. And now I want to do the same thing, trimming at the end. I'm going to, for now, just pick that part and then cut it off. And um, now when I rewind and play, no handling noise anymore, um, but the entry into the sound is very abrupt. Um, so in addition to trimming sounds, in other words, to chopping off undesired parts at the beginning and the end, it's really, really common to fade in and out of sounds. And although we won't notice it with a very noisy sound like this wave recording, um, with many sounds, if you don't fade in or fade out at least uh, a tiny, tiny bit at the beginning of each sound, um, you'll get clicks and pops. And the reason these clicks and pops happen um, basically is because if the sound level is really high and that's the moment where the sound starts, you'll get a kind of pop. Um, as the loudspeaker or whatever else you're listening on suddenly jumps up to that point. Now that won't happen if you gradually fade into the sound. So it's really common to fade in and fade out of sounds. And the way that we do that with Audacity is to select the region we want to fade in over and then go on the effect menu here and there's an option for fade in. And when I pick that we can kind of see over here how the waveform now starts smaller and as it goes over the region we identified, it gets larger and we have a nice fade in. And we can do the same thing uh, at the end, too. We can do a fade out. Now let's listen to the beginning of this again. Let's listen to our fade out as well for good measure. And that fade out, I think maybe, is a bit abrupt. Um, what if I wanted a more natural fade out, something that seemed to mirror a little bit more the natural rhythm of the wave? So I'm going to undo, um, press Command Z, Control Z on Windows, and I'm going to highlight a slightly longer region. And I'm just guessing here on how long it needs to be. And I'm going to do the fade out again. And now I'm going to listen to that. Well, that's much better, much less abrupt. Um, so in that sequence of operations I just did there where I undid and I did the fade again after the undo, um, I think that's po pointing to a really fundamental thing, uh, not just about working with audio, but about working with media. And I think I've emphasized it too in other contexts that basically what we're doing um, as media producers often is that we're in front of these really detailed media representations and we're listening to them or we're watching them and we're making changes. And then if they don't work, we're undoing it and we're doing it again, undoing it, doing it again, undoing it, doing it again, and so on and so forth. And, and in that way, by a long series of little adjustments, we arrive at things that um, really speak in a, a very expressive and a very communicative, maybe in a very striking um, way. So working with audio, often one of the things that you work really obsessively with are the way that sounds enter and leave, how long 
um, how short or how slow or how quick or how slow these fades in and out of the, the sounds are. And if I was working on this sound for real and not simply as part of a demonstration in a lecture, I would probably obsess about these fades in and out for, I don't know, another 20 minutes or so um, before moving on. Uh, I've certainly spent um, uh, hours. Uh, press Command A to pick it all. I could, I could have clicked and dragged to pick it as well. And I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. So now on the clipboard, I have a copy of that sound. And if I wanted, I could pay, I could position the cursor somewhere else and I could paste Command V on Mac, Control V on Windows. I could paste that copy of the sound in after the other sound. Um, but I'm not going to do that right now, so I'm going to undo that. Um, before I paste the sound somewhere else, I'm going to put it on a new track. So over here I have the Tracks menu. At the top I have Add New. And uh, I'm going to paste my sound, uh, a copy of my sound, into a new track. And it's a stereo sound. It's got two channels, left and right, as we saw. So I need to, I need to make a stereo track to hold the, the copy of the sound as well. So I'm going to make a new stereo track. And lo and behold, we get a new area in which we can work with sounds uh, alongside the other one. Um, and I'm going to go about halfway through. Oops. Didn't mean to press play there. Uh, I'm going to position it about halfway through uh, the sound. Uh, I'm going to make sure this track is highlighted. And I'm going to paste. And now what you see is I have a broad area where one sound overlaps with the other. Now what you can do when you have these long overlaps is you can make one sound fade in while the other fades out. So I'm gonna take the second sound and do a fade, long fade in on it. And I'm gonna take the first sound and do a long fade out on it about around approximately the same time. And now I'm gonna listen. <laughs> So you see by the end there, we were entirely listening to the second sound, um, but there was no real clear moment where we got a sense of, this, of a second sound replacing the first sound. It just sounded like a long, continuous texture. Um, so this crossfade technique, where one sound fades out over approximately the same span of time that another sound fades in, is really useful for um, taking background ambiences or background textures and extending or changing their length in time. We started with a recording that was just over a minute long, um, but by the end of our crossfade, we have a similar recording that is getting closer to two minutes long. Um, so we're turning the time aspect of the recording into something that we can manipulate in a simple way. And this is a very, very important idea um, for the second project that we're going to do in the course, whether it's done with audio or video or animation. This idea of uh, emphasizing in our time-based media work how we can um, stretch or transform or manipulate the element of time. We're going to come back to that concept of transforming the time of audio um, a second in a slightly different and more profound way. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk about the concept of keyframes. If I click over here and change the default tool um, to this second one, I can see from Audacity's pop-up hint that this is the envelope tool. Now an envelope in audio basically refers to the way that the levels of a sound um, change um, over time in a kind of zoomed out way. So when we fade in um, a recording, we're, we are making a certain change to the envelope of that piece of audio. When we fade out a recording, we're making another change to the envelope of that audio. 
Now, earlier we did that kind of change with the fade in and fade out effect here, but there is a more powerful and generalizable and flexible way of doing these kind of things. And so that's with the envelope tool. If I click on the envelope tool, and um, when I do that, I get these blue lines above and below each of my audio channels. And if I click somewhere in the channel, I get a set of dots that appear. And if I click somewhere else, I get another set of dots that appear. And if I drag on the dots, I can make changes to the level of the audio. So I've, I've, made, one ch I've made a change here and I made a change here. And if you look in between, there's been a smooth transition from the very low level here to the, ver the, to the much higher level here. So I've made a kind of fade in effect. But unlike the fade in effect um, that we did earlier here, I can continue to add these points and transitions and I can, I can make the level go down and up again and down and up again. And I can also um, quickly move these dots to slightly different positions, either in time or in level. That's really key because you know one of the key ideas I keep coming back to again and again um, with you folks is that high quality media work depends on being able to quickly make changes and improvements to iteratively tune things until they go from being relatively raw and rough things into being perhaps things that are quite striking um, and things that are very carefully considered. So the envelope tool lets us do that much more detailed work with the levels of sound on the audio. Uh, and it's, a, it's an example of a much more general concept in digital media projects, time-based media projects in particular, the concept of keyframes. So basically each of these points here that we added, a control point, each of those are a keyframe in this project. A keyframe is a moment at which some parameter of the project arrives um, at a desired value. And an integral part of the concept of keyframes is that between the keyframes, there's a smooth transition. So for example, here at the beginning, we have a keyframe here, and then here at around the 37 second mark, we have another keyframe, but in between, the level smoothly changes between the levels of those two keyframes. So that's something that we're gonna see in our video and our animation projects as well. Um, uh, it's a very, very important concept. All right, we have two more key points um, to hit. So I said that we were gonna come back to this idea of transforming the time of audio. So now we're gonna do that. I'm gonna delete both of the tracks that I've made so far. And I'm gonna import a different audio file. I'm gonna import this recording I have from when my daughter was, I think about um, one years old. The date on the file here is not accurate. It wasn't 2010, it was more like 2013. Sometimes the dates get scrambled on files. And it's a recording of her saying, huh, here it is. <laughs> Maybe I'll reduce the level in case that was clipping a little bit for you. I'm not sure if it was. So quick recording of a baby's voice. Doesn't last very long at all. Now one of the earliest changes that people discovered they could make to audio when it was recorded in an analog form on something like a wax cylinder or a um, LP player or um, um, a magnetic tape player where a motor is turning um, a reel containing the tape around, is that they could change the speed at which these things revolved. Um, and that when they changed the speed at which these things revolved, it took, for example, if they slowed down the speed of the motor, that it would take longer to get through the same sound. And that there were other changes that happened at the same time. Um, right. Um, I said I was going to come back to this idea of transforming the time of sounds um, in a more profound way. So I have um, reloaded um, uh, an interesting sound, um, a recording of my daughter when she was nearly one years old. And now what I'm going to explore with it is the transformation, sometimes known as classical speed change. And basically this is the equivalent of changing the speed of the playback motor in uh, a record player, or a wax cylinder player, or a magnetic tape player. If I pick all the sound, and then uh, go to effect, there's change speed. 
and it gives me the chance to enter a speed multiplier where 1 is no change. So if I enter 0.25, it's going to play back four times as slow. And if you look down here, it's predicting what will happen to the length of the sound. Our, our selected sound is just under half a second long. And when it's slowed down by four times, of course, it's going to be four times longer, or just about two seconds. But that's not the only thing that's going to happen. Let's do it, and then let's listen to it. So that was our, our sound. It's gotten a lot lower in pitch. Let's go back to the original. Here was the original. Yeah. And when I redo the transformation, mm. there's the transformed one. So we've learned something about this speed change or classical speed change. It's a transformation where sounds don't play back as fast. And as they're stretched over that larger time, they also tend to get lower in pitch um, because those frequencies are getting lower as well. Um, let's try one more variation of this transformation. I'm going to undo it, and I'm going to pick it again. Um, there we go. And I'm going to do a more extreme speed change. Instead of 0.125, instead of 0.25, I'm going to do 0.125 or one eighth of the original speed. So it's going to go from being a half second to being almost four seconds. And it's going to sound something like this. OK, so that, that transformation, classical speed change, has been used in thousands or ten thousands of different ways by musicians and media artists working with sound over the last 60 years. Lots of other transformations of sound are possible. and totally encourage you to explore some of the ones that are available here uh, on the effect menu in Audacity. But that change, changing the speed of the sound to make sounds uh, longer and lower in pitch has been used more than any other transformation. And I think that um, perhaps part of the reason for that is that when we take things and we make them take longer, we are giving audiences the chance to get inside the sound. We're giving audiences the chance to experience uh, a normal thing in a not normal way. Uh, we're giving them the chance to have more time and attention um, for the details. So I think that's why musicians and artists have um, explored this transformation so much. And um, if you choose to do an audio project in um, this portion of the course for, the, for your second project, um, I encourage you also to make um, that um, uh, a main feature of your explorations. So there's one more thing that we have to talk about, uh, and then we're finished this first video lecture, and that's getting uh, our projects delivered to an audience. As we mentioned earlier, um, our Audacity project files are, 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 are exactly that. They're project files. They're a working format. They don't necessarily contain um, much or any of our audio data, they're like a complex set of instructions for how the project should be put together. Uh, we can't actually give it that to someone because um, they may not have the software necessary to load that fancy esoteric project format. Uh, and also, um, the project format being just a list of instructions, it references a lot of other different files. Uh, and so there's a, there's a good chance that something would get lost in um, delivery. Um, that way. So what we need to do is to take our, be able to take our projects and render them down to a single simple audio file that we know other people are going to be able to play. So in Audacity, that's the export audio option here. And we're going to see this again in our video and animation um, lectures and technical exercises. This same structure of having on the one hand a place where you save a project file for your work and on the other hand, a place where you export a deliverable file that you can give to other people. So if I go to the export audio dialog, I can pick a name for the file and I can pick a format for it. Um, and there's a, a bunch of com common options here. Um, AIFF and WAVE are um, very detailed formats that don't compress or throw away any of the audio data in any way. Um, 
The most detailed format here is um, Wave 32-bit float. Um, however, many people won't be able to play that back depending on what kind of playback software they have on their machine. And below here we see MP3 files, which is, as you know, a very common compressed format for delivering audio. It's a compression format. In other words, um, some of the audio data that the algorithm feels is not particularly perceptually relevant is discarded in order to make the file not take up very much space. Um, in this course, Delivering an Audio Project, I think that um, WAVE 16-bit PCM uh, is a perfectly um, uh, suitable delivery format. You know, that's going to give you audio stereo audio files that um, are about 10 megabytes per minute. Um, so if you have a five or six minute project, it's going to be about 50 or 60 megabytes. Um, and that's a, a very reasonable size to be able to upload to Avenue. Well, that's uh, um, all I have to say for today's uh, video lecture. Um, I know I went through quite a bit there and it was quite fast, but uh, it's a video so you can go um, back and review uh, as you need to. And I would also encourage you if there were any things that were unclear or if there are any things you'd like to ask some questions about, please do ask questions on the relevant Avenue forum post um, and that way we can have a little bit of discussion. All right, till the next time, take care.